In this segment, we're going to talk about a semantic parsing formalism called CCG, or Combinatory Categorial Grammar. This is due to Steedman and Savolksi in, in the 1980s, and they wanted it to formalize a bridge between syntax and semantics. So the, this is going to be a bit of a different syntactic representation than we've seen so far, and the reason is because it's going to allow us to, in parallel, derive a syntactic parse and also a lambda calculus expression. So we are going to see a couple of kinds of syntactic categories that are going to look a little bit different. So we're going to still have S and NP, which are going to be the same as we've seen in constituency, uh, but we're also going to have what we call slash categories. Uh, so here's an example, m and m sings, m and is a noun phrase and the whole thing's a sentence, that's fine, but the way we analyze sings is now no longer as a verb phrase. Verb phrases don't really have concrete enough semantics to nail down exactly what's going to go on here, so instead we define it as this thing s back np, um, where I'm going to use back to refer to backslash. So the what this says is that this is a syntactic category that if it combines with a noun phrase on its left, that's what the backslash means, forward slash would be on the right. If I combine with a noun phrase on my left, I form a sentence. So, it, it, you know, think of it as like S minus NP, right? It's like once you add NP to it, it, it becomes a sentence. And this is how we're going to think about verbs. They're basically whole sentences, but missing arguments. So the nice thing about this is that when we build this tree here, when we combine this s back np and this np, we are both going to kind of do the correct arithmetic on the syntax side of things in black here and make a sentence, but there is also a parallel instance of function application. So s back np means that I am expecting an np argument. So on the semantic side of things in orange, we have a lambda calculus expression that expects also one argument, lambda y. And so when we combine these two things, we are going to apply the lambda calculus expression to M and M over here, and we're going to produce this representation sings. All right, so uh, we can also handle two place predicates in the same way. So this would handle the, the born example that we saw in the, in the previous segment, um, but we can also express things like Oklahoma borders Texas. So here borders is an s back np forward np. And so this is a, an expression that first needs an np on the right in order to produce an s back np, right? So it's like it's like sings, but uh, it kind of needs even needs even an additional argument. And this is reflected in the fact that its lambda calculus expression has two arguments. So as a verb, borders is going to need an np on its right for this lambda x the kind of thing that's being bordered, and then it's going to need an NP on its left, uh, and it's going to, that's going to be the thing bordering. So you can see here that, again, we can build this tree that follows the lambda calculus backbone that we've built up, while also respecting this the, the kind of arithmetic of this new syntactic rep representation we have from CCG. All right, so the reason we're going to, well, the reason we want to do this is because we have a sentence, if we, if we have a question like what states border Texas, this is going to allow us to form a lambda calculus representation from the sentence. So here, border, again, we, we just saw how this piece of it works, is this s back np forward np. And states, we are going to have here as just a bare noun that is just going to, uh, it's going to be a, a function that it's, we can think of it as a filter that requires that uh, things that pass this filter be states. All right, and then what is going to be kind of a monstrosity here? So what, I'm not going to try to fully unpack what's going on here. Basically, it needs a noun and an s back np in order to form a sentence. And so what, what this is basically saying is, all right, I, like this is a particular usage of what. This is not like the only analysis of what. This is the analysis of what in this particular sentence where it's going to say, okay, you know, like what x do y is, is essentially what this what encodes. So 
when we combine this, everything kind of works out here. So it needs it needs a function. So it it, it kind of eats up state lambda x state here, um, and then it combines with s back n p here, and it produces this final expression lambda x state of x and borders x Texas. So again, if we have a big database of states, we or, or a big database of entities, let's say we scroll through and we say, okay, give me all the states, and those states have to border Texas. So this is a very nice representation of this question, but the way that we got here was a little bit tricky. And in particular, uh, you know, the way the way I want you to think about what is like kind of take the final answer, which we know has to be something that looks like this, and then back solve for what what has to be in this case. So it turns out there there are kind of many entries in what we call the lexicon. This this first level mapping of you know what kinds of both syntactic and semantic uh, forms, what can take. And the big challenge of CCG parsing is how to pick the right entry from the lexicon. So it turns out that once you have these lexicon entries, there's actually really only one way we can put these all together in order to form a parse. So unlike in syntactic parsing, where it was like we had a noun phrase, a verb phrase, a prepositional phrase, and you're like, oh no, how do these things combine? Here, there's only one way to combine, but figuring out those atomic pieces requires looking at the whole sentence and understanding what's actually going to go on. So one, one thing people do is they build very sophisticated what are called super taggers for this, which have to uh, associate each word with a set of lexicon entries. And so this you can think of this as like pruning the lexicon and building a set of uh, possible analyses that then we're going to try to combine with the rest of the sentence to actually form the parse. All right, how do we actually build these parses? So the issue here is that let's say you produce training data in the following way. You get people to write down a whole bunch of questions. And then you write down, all right, here's, given my database, here's how I want to execute this question. Um, here's the like form of the filter expression that I want. The problem is that this is not specific. It doesn't tell us how we derive this lambda calculus expression from the question. Um, and so what I mean by that is, for example, Texas here has to be analyzed as this NPE89. Uh, and that's reasonably easy to figure out with some heuristics, but it's not specified in the supervised data. And then how do we know that what corresponds to this crazy thing, right? Like that crazy thing doesn't show up in the final expression in the top right at all. So you have to infer this without being explicitly told it. And so Zettelmoyer and Collins in uh, their work in 2005, they came up with this procedure called GenLex that takes a logical form, kind of chops it up in every imaginable way, takes a sentence, chops it up in every imaginable way, and says, OK, like I'm going to assume that any kind of mapping between these things is valid, and then we're going to let learning figure it out. And so you have this training procedure, which more or less treats this alignment between the logical form in the sentence as a latent variable, and the only supervision you get is this logical form and the correct answer. So the system has to do a lot of work, and you have to build in a lot of tricks in order to get it to actually build the right representations here. All right, so what we could do is we could spend the next you know, big chunk of time trying to understand exactly how this works and build up this kind of parser. But instead, we're going to use this as an opportunity to explore a different paradigm for doing things. So these parsers so far have been a little bit tough to build. Um, we saw different ways of handling things like constituency um, and transition-based parsers for dependency, um, and we kind of understand those, but now there's this whole new CCG semantic parsing thing that has this whole separate set of challenges. And so rather than have to deal with those challenges uh, and, and build up all the machinery there, instead we're going to punt on it. Uh, and in fact, this is kind of a good idea in general because there's some fundamental issues here in linguistics about this bridge between syntax and semantics that is going to make it hard to even kind of formalize this stuff anyway, and there's, there's going to be holes in what we do. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to switch over to using sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. That's going to allow us to directly learn to map from this input sentence into 
a lambda calculus representation without having to actually model how it gets derived. We just let the neural net kind of figure it out. And so it's, that's going to look like taking this and putting it through our magic neural net box and it just spits out this lambda calculus representation and we're done. So we'll see that this is not as simple as it appears and it, you know, it turns out that there's some reasons to prefer the parsing thing. Um, and in particular, when people first started doing the seek to seek approach, uh, it, it worked much less well as, as much as it's flexible. But, uh, you know, now that, now that we kind of understand more about how to build these kind of seek to seek models and we understand their strengths, it's really a big benefit that it allows us to break away from relying on these formal uh, kind of syntactic ideas like CCG for how to construct these lambda calculus representations. And that's the end of this segment.